I believe that now in this planet, with all of these problems that we have, what is necessary is mindset shift. Welcome to The Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. At this point, uh, we're at about 30 episodes, almost 30 episodes, and the podcast has received... Uh, over 10,000 downloads across all its episodes, which seems like uh, quite a big landmark moment. So thank you to everyone who's been a regular listener and has, uh, you know, gotten gotten something out of this. I really uh, feel grateful that there's people out there who want to connect to these issues and maybe learn something from the guests I have on. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it going. And if you're uh, a new listener, you're very, very welcome. Um, this podcast, my name is Ross. I'm an urban designer. This podcast is all about how urbanists, architects, planners, uh, policymakers, transport engineers, anyone working in cities can um, address the sustainability and climate crisis issues within cities. Um, and also we sometimes talk about wider sustainability issues as well. Today's episode is a fascinating, uh, wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Hussain Sadri. Hussain is concerned with making the planet a better place to live and work. He's an activist, designer, writer, and teacher. And he is also the co-founder of D-Urban Design Studio, the design laboratory that reimagines human settlements as ethical, ecological, and equitable living habitats. He teaches architecture at Coventry University and also runs a an online educational platform called Eco, Ecodemia. In this episode, we talk about this concept of de-urban design, which is D-E, urban design, why we need a radical paradigm shift to solve the challenges of climate change and ecological destruction, why we need to think in the long term, the very long term, and building cities for multiple generations, and what we can learn from indigenous cultures. We talk about some really big picture stuff and concepts uh, you don't often hear in relation to urban design and architecture. Hussein is certainly the most radical person I've had on the podcast, and he says himself in the episode that he is looking for nothing less than a total paradigm shift in the way we think about the world and our relationship with it. Guaranteed, there will be moments in this episode that will surprise you, that will challenge you, maybe make you feel defensive. I'd invite you to stick with it and and be open to the concepts we discuss. Hussein certainly gave me a lot to think about, which really, that's what this is all about. I'm not just here to tell you things you already know. (laughs) Uh, Just a little housekeeping note, uh, it seems like there was some you know, we did this conversation over video call. It seems like there were some Windows updates going on in the background and some sounds got picked up on the recording. It's not a problem, but just in case you hear this sound, that's why that's there. It's just a random <laughs> artifact of communicating digitally. It's not there for any artistic reason. Uh, you can learn more about Hussein at uh, Ecodemia, uh, which I'll leave links to uh, in the podcast description. Um, And you can also follow The Green Urbanist, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please enjoy this uh, conversation with Dr. Hussein Sadri. Welcome, uh, Hussein, to The Green Urbanist podcast. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Rose, and thank you very much for inviting me. Absolute pleasure. Please just begin by telling us a bit about yourself, um, who you are, and what you do. Yes, uh, I I studied architecture uh, in you know my formal education, and then uh, I I tried to somehow interrelate architecture with politics in my master. 
So I did my master about uh, public space and their uh, interrelation with democratization of societies. And then uh, I continued with some political uh, approach to architecture where in my PhD studies and I looked at the relation between architecture and human rights. Mm. And uh, as one of the most political uh, problems of our uh, century and our generation, uh, I started dealing with climate change, the uh, ecological degradations and all of these problems as well. And uh, I learned more about permaculture design and regenerative approaches. And from 2015, uh, with my partner, Sanam, together we, we established a think tank and design laboratory with the name of uh, the Urban Design Studio. Uh, that's all these ideas of the Urban Design is actually coming from that uh, institute. And uh, very recently in 2020, as one of the main, uh, let's say, knowledge sharing activities of the Urban Design Studio, we established uh, Ecodemia uh, as an ethical and socio ecological academia. And there we, we are trying to just reach more people and uh, develop the knowledge and skills in the fields of regenerative design and kind of resiliency and, and yeah, and so on. I, I want to come back and just ask you a bit more about uh, permaculture, but maybe I can do that later in um later in the in the chat if i just make a mental note of it and the first thing you know is just to to if you could explain to us what is this concept of de-urban design you know i i describe myself as an urban designer are you <laughs> the opposite of that <laughs> or uh, is it uh different <laughs> yeah yeah it's it can be said that yes i am kind of opposite of it but <laughs> but yeah we have the, we have root in the same earth probably the, the idea of the urban design is actually uh, a critical uh, investigation on uh, the idea of urbanization and kind of urban civilization. So with, with urban, what, what, what we mean, mean uh, we mean mainly uh, capitalism, mainly industrialization, mainly modernism, mainly the, the civilization that is based on industry, mechanical thinking way, the understanding that human is capable and also, also ethically able to decide about everything and create systems mm. and uh, change change all the way that nature works. So this is, this is our understanding or definition of urbanization. And yes, we are against it. And uh, we believe that human is not capable i mean the knowledge of human is not enough to decide mm. to change the way that nature acts and also ethically is not able to do that you know is is must not doing it must not do that uh so for that reason we try to define other ways of inhabiting in this planet without just fighting with it, without fighting with all the other creatures, mm. with climate, with with wind, with sun, with everything on this planet. So just just uh, try to re-indigenize ourselves in this planet as, as our ancestors for hundreds of thousands of years dwelled in this planet in a kind of peace. Uh, doesn't mean that they didn't have any fight with any tigers, uh, but it was <laughs> kind of... You know, uh, cases, not not all their life was based on the fight with nature, yes. but, but occasionally, of course, they had to protect themselves. And it is understandable. But but yeah, just just trying to find ways of re-indigenizing ourselves on this planet as 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 real, real Earthians, you know, not not as humans, not as a kind of species, you know, kind of racism that, you know, we think. Humans are more able or are wiser or are capable mm. more. But yeah, as, 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 as one of the Earthians that are living on this planet, we find also re rediscover, let's say, the knowledge that we already forgot it mainly 
uh, how to how to dwell better. That's that's there's so many points in there that I'm just grabbing onto and I find so interesting. Uh, there's there's a fabulous book called um, Civilized to Death by Dr. Chris Ryan, which looks he basically makes the argument that we were much better off as hunter gatherers and that all the evidence we have of that is that that was a, a much better life compared to civilization and it's basically since agriculture it's all gone downhill basically um <laughs> so i can i can see that um that critique of civilization being you know quite core to this uh de-urban design approach yeah so uh it is it is but at the same time there is a very strong strong uh emphasis on the idea of design as well uh so still we keep we kept design there but uh Maybe at at least for now it is there. Let's say, so not sure mm. in the future also will will remain there, because what we call design is a bit different than what industrial uh, way of or mechanical way of design is happening. So so just let's go one by one. First of all, we speak about design because. We are not living anymore in the time of hunters and gatherers. The planet is not the same. We are not the same. We are yeah. 8 billion. <laughs> so, we can't go back. So, yeah. so for that reason, it is, I mean, yes, we can learn a lot. If we can have an access to, to the knowledge of uh, indigenized people or indigenous people, which mainly we don't have access, even, even the remaining indigenous people are not, uh, fully, you know, uh, living in the same way that their ancestors were living. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is this is one one uh, side of the fact. But the other side is also that, you know, even even if we reach to that knowledge, that knowledge cannot be enough for surviving in this time because the planet has changed, and the population of human is changed, the technology is changed, and loads of other things are changed. So for that reason, design is a, a very essential part of it uh, to, to understand how we can readapt this planet and ourselves to the conditions that will make our planet, our cities, our civilizations, our lifestyles, all of these more close, evolutionary, you know, to, to the way that, you know, our mm. ancestors were settling on this planet. And that doesn't mean really that kind of very primitive, I mean, that's these are inside the blanket, you know, the kind of... Uh, uh, definitions that usually modern people are defining, but but also, I mean, uh, the other values that are important. One of them is believing that everything on this planet is alive, so uh, no, nothing is dead, nothing is material. So we don't have materials and living beings. So the stone is living, water is living, light is living, and you know. Everything is living in this planet and everything is conscious. So it is not only humans or, all, or only humans and animals and plants that are conscious, but everything is conscious. And there is a great consciousness that it's, it is outside of the, uh, let's say, perception of human beings. And this is, this is one of the essential values of indigenous people that, you know, they see all as part of each other because mm. you know at the end that water is inside my body you know one of the examples that mostly I, I give to my students I speak about the cycle of water that it changes every hundred I mean it is it we, you, we need hundred million years for all the water drops on this planet to change their cycle so their molecules <sighs> will be broken and come together again. And it needs 100 million years. Wow. And we know that inside Hossein, there is a huge amount of water, okay? Mm -hmm. So that means that most likely part of this water remains from the time of dinosaurs. Wow. So this is, this is the consciousness that I'm talking about, you know? It is a kind of... And this water has a memory. This water has... I mean, this water was witnessing that time, and it is in my body... So I am very ephemeral and, you know, very mortal, 
But this water, these drops of water inside my body are remaining and mm. more immortal than me. They are also immortal because they will die in 100 million years. So that, that, that means that, you know, I, I cannot just say this water is a material yeah. and I cannot use the same concepts that modern ecologists are using as like polluting water, you know, is, is can I pollute you as, as a human being? I mean, it is a more kind of conceptual meaning. So the same meaning can be referred to water as well, you know, so it is, it can be polluting that way, but but it is not a very material way. But it, the moment that we see water, we see stones, we see rocks, all of these as materials, we give the permission for ourselves as as these immort as these mortal ephemeral beings to change them, to mm. smash the rock. But if we recognize that that rock is part of me, and lives longer than me and was here before than me. So then before smashing it, you have to think hundred times that if I am allowed to smash it or if I am allowed to decide instead of that rock or not. It, it, it's sort of about having this this deep, deep respect for for, for any sort of natural thing you, you might find. And, and rather than, I mean, it's such a big mindset shift because we're used to thinking of these things as resources you know, minerals, uh, water, and sort of putting a figure on them and counting them. Um, and, and especially when we talk about constructing buildings, constructing roads, urban, that process of urbanization is so material intensive. How do you, uh, when you start with this mindset of, you know, this deep, deep respect for for all these elements, how do you then even think about creating a building or or <laughs> or growing a city? You know, what's the sort of, how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it's a very huge responsibility. So uh, the approach is, of course, I mean, we, we believe that, you know, the, the way that modern uh, culture defines science and knowledge is not really the best way. So we don't believe on any individual knowledge. Uh, we don't, but we, we believe on more kind of a collective way of, learning or collective way of knowing uh, the facts. So we know that Hussein doesn't know a lot, but Hussein, Ross, Stone and Water, if the four of them come together, they will know much more. So that now that the essential part is how to bring Water, Ross and Hussein and Rock together and make a platform that they can discuss and come to a conclusion. So this is this is the point. So one of the issues is that, I mean, this, yeah, as you said, this is mindset shift. So mm. we, we need to know that, okay, we don't know, but if we come together uh, and then we say we, that doesn't mean, doesn't refer to humans and doesn't okay. refer to living beings. So it refers to humans, living beings, and non-living beings as well. So we come together and put all of our knowledge on top of each other or uh, beside each other, and then we, we create that knowledge. So this is the first essential thing that I want to say. And then the second thing is uh, we, we understand the time as well. I, I think this is this is one of the main issues that modern culture doesn't really understand it or doesn't want to understand it. So we, we as humans, we live something around, let's say, eight years. Mm-hmm. So we have we have a uh, yeah life span that it's eight years, but eight years in compare with the life of planet is just nothing. <laughs> yeah, it is it is inconsequential. I, nothing. It is maybe just one breath in whole my life. You know, it is it is maybe even it's not that one as well, and then. <laughs> This one, in, in compared to the life of human beings even, which mm. is human beings are very recent, you know, animals, as you know. So it is 300, 350,000 years. Uh, sorry, tr- yeah, 350,000 years. So it is, it's almost n- very small 
you know, and very recent part of the planet's life. But even, you know, eight years in compared to humans' culture is nothing. If you look at agriculture, you know, I, I used to, when we had blackboards in the classrooms, I used to draw a line in the classroom. And because we are in architecture school, so we have all these tables and whatever. So I, I used to measure it to 350,000 to, to scale it down to three and a half meter. Okay. And then the last 10,000 years is just one centimeter of it. Oh my God. So and this 10,000 years is the time that we, we are living as settled, you know, yes. human beings on this planet with agriculture and all of this, that this, this. So, so it is, we are talking about just last one centimeter of three and a half meter history that we have. So if we just recognize it, and this one centimeter is all the last 10,000 years. So all the religions are here, all mm. the written knowledge and myth. And I mean, everything that we know and we think that this is the truth is just the last one centimeter of it. It is just the... Just nothing. It's just a bubble yeah. on top of, uh, you know, water is the sea. So for that reason, and this is, I mean, this bubble is the last 10,000 years. So I'm just repeating it to just come to the point that. <laughs> so Hussein's life means nothing. So if Hussein's life means nothing, so Hussein cannot decide to build a house, even mm. one building. Because it's a huge change on the planet and on the environment. So, okay, how it can be, then this is the question. It must be transgenerational. It must be very long term. So with, with very long term, we don't mean just 20 years. Because in you know urban planning, when you say long, long term, you say 20 years, you know. <laughs> with long term, we mean minimum three generations. Minimum three generations. But luckily, more than three generations, luckily 1,000 generations or 1 million generations is much better than three generations. But if you want to change anything on this planet, you need to have a very long term, you know, reason for doing it. Hmm. So, you, I mean, it is, it is, it is like, you know, I, I give these examples to uh, some of the students in, in the class, actually, that, you know, imagine my house, I'm going to have a trip. And I'm giving the key of my house to Ross to come and settle the weekend in my house. And then when I return on Monday, I see that Ross demolished one of the walls, <laughs> changed the kitchen, you know. <laughs> it is not acceptable. <laughs> yeah? You, you will not accept it because, you know, you are, you are a temporal residence, you know. Mm. So you don't have the permission to do this change because... You are just here for a weekend. Yeah. So that I, is that is less than weekend our time. You know, it is, <laughs> it is just for one second. Imagine <sighs> I open my door, you jump to my house, and, you know, in my uh, magic, you know. <laughs> with, with a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> it changed everything, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. It's it 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 almost feels like because I've 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 done that thought experiment before of putting our our you know civilization and then you can also start with what about when did the first large city you know it was like Rome ancient Rome the first city with one million people was like you know uh, you know two, four thousand years ago or something or two thousand years ago and you think that's even shorter and you think when did London have one million people oh in the nineteenth century it was like it's like yesterday and you start to realize that like. The, all the apparatus we build up around ourselves, the the methods of construction, the industry and everything. It's almost like a kind of experiment. It's like we went off on one track as a species. You know, we went down this one rabbit hole and now we're we're sort of seeing how the world is reacting to that in terms of climate change, in terms of inequality and all this environmental degradation. The experiment has gone horribly wrong. And so, the you know, the I, I, I sort of see where you're coming from is this idea of we need to change our, if we're going, going to try and like do anything about this, you need to start at the top and change your perspective, your mindset shift, because the one we have now is obviously not working. Definitely. Definitely yeah. I agree. Because I think, I think, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, as, as one of the first things that I learned is from, from indigenous mindset is, you know, just stop criticizing or complaining, you know, 
a lot because this is also part of the modern culture that you know we just you know constantly criticize and you know just speak about negative things but uh, i would say you know i'm i'm really afraid that you know our even most activist movements are just uh simulating or repeating the same mindset that their enemies are doing so this this is this is the fear that i have because i mean yeah i don't know how, how radical i am allowed to talk but oh, let's, go, let's for go ahead it. you know let's imagine that we are in a pub and just is a yeah really <laughs> it's a it's a free forum here yeah <laughs> so i don't accept any responsibility on all of these that i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> but i mean imagine if we say okay we want to rewild all Britain and reforest it. We want to reforest all Britain. I mean, this mm-hmm. is. I'm not going to support this idea. Really? Yeah. Because it's too much. Where it's humans jumping I, back in. I, I'm not allowed to do that. My generation is not allowed to do that. It is a very huge change, in a very huge scale, that I'm not allowed to do that. I am allowed to plant five trees in my garden. I am allowed to, you know, and if, I mean, yeah, I mean, permaculture, we, let's, let's bridge to permaculture. Yeah, please, yeah. So one of the key, key things that in permaculture is discussed is uh, small scale, slow solutions. Mm. So small scale is, is very essential because you know, once upon a time, I had a very tiny house with with something around, you know, very small garden. I mean, as, as small as this room, maybe. Okay. And I was spending all my uh, evening times and weekend times in that small garden, you know, 10 square meter garden, let's say. And that that was a great experience for me because, because of the size of... I could observe nature more if mm-hmm. the size was 3,000 3, square meter or three, three acre or whatever, you know. I saw that always I'm loser. So whatever I want to grow, ants, mainly ants, <laughs> they destroy it. And then later I realized that the main reason is that I'm only working one hour a day but ants are a lot and they are working more, you know? So the 24 hours they're working there, basically. However, that in that small scale, in in maybe three or four years I was in that house, I did many mistakes mm. in that 10 square meter. I I am a permaculture designer. I studied agriculture. I, I, I had a, an experience in it. And in 10 square meter, I made, and I am an architect, I know ecological design, you know, I'm teaching all of this for the last 20 years. And in 10 square meter, I did loads of mistakes. Okay. So do you think that I am allowed to reforest mm. all Britain? So I decide about the type of wood I'm going to grow, decide about their places, decide about... No. So th- this is, I mean, I think we need to just, yeah, understand these limits. Limits of human knowledge. If human, if the science, modern science, was really capable, in the last two years, <laughs> we didn't have this life, Yeah. So just because of one virus, that if yeah. you collect all of them, all the COVID-19 viruses from the world, they can fit in one spoon? <laughs> with, with all the knowledge of two, 21st century medicine, Harvard, Oxford, you know, all of these millions of dollars of budgets, all the capitalist countries, all the, you know, still... You know, we are afraid of it, afraid of that virus. And we want to still be the only one deciding to change mm-hmm. all the planet. 
to something that we think it is positive. So I, I just question this. Okay, we say that reforesting Britain is positive, but how we know it? Yeah. The modern the modern scientists hundred years ago, they were thinking that what they are doing is also positive to the planet. The the very interesting uh, story of the inventor of plastic bag. I don't know if, if you read about it. It's very interesting. I, I think it's Scandinavian. I, I don't remember. Maybe Finnish. Uh, it's an inventor, ecologist inventor, who designed plastic bag. And the reason was he realized that loads of paper bags is used and just throw it away and <laughs> loads of trees are cut. So he invented plastic bag that, you know, you, you can just wash it and use it again. And, you know, so it is it is not any damage, damage to the nature and nothing. So see how positive intention he had? Yeah, yeah. But... Positive intention is not enough. Yeah. Just being environmentalist, ecologist is not enough. Just accepting your limits and knowing that, you know, you as one person, you are just nothing and you can just do nothing. So, but if you can come together with your next generation and their future generation and their future generation and talk to wind talk to water talk to stones and talk to the soil talk to the ants you know and then okay change it but yeah <laughs> be mindful of all the risks i i i totally agree with this you know this need to be humble i mean i often think that when people are optimistic that we will invent our way out of climate change i just think you know we got into this problem through ignorance uh greed you know uh you know misconceived notions about how the world works like it, it, we haven't gotten here because we're so great we've gotten here because of all of our failings and i don't see how we're suddenly going to become a, a perfect species to solve it in the same way that we created it um but i would love to, to understand because i suppose we've been talking in in conceptual terms what i'd love to understand from you as a designer is like let's say if someone approaches you and says okay hossein i'm gonna i'm gonna hire you for this project whatever the the the, the project is in some city like what how do you approach this as a designer uh in terms of it could be a master plan it could be a strategy or something something like that or do you just stay away from that yeah i uh so I will start with some, uh, again, conceptual answers, but I will definitely come to the practical answers okay. as well. You know that, you know, it's, I, I'm, a, I'm escaping from it, but I know that I have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the conceptual level is, I see definitely this, these opportunities for starting, you know, mindset shift, uh, let's say, in, I, I see it as an invitation Mm. for this mindset shift. So I use it for that purpose. At the end, you know, I, I call myself designer, but I'm probably more a person dealing with education than design. So okay. I, I use I use that part of me because I believe that now in this planet, with all of these problems that we have, what is necessary is mindset shift. It is not really the park that is needed there in that corner. Or, so, I mean, these are all secondary. But what it is essential is that mindset shift. And this is my approach. So uh, what I do, I, I, I try to constantly design because uh, people, when, when, I mean, design is a process. And in the design process, you, you work with others and this, this creates a communication uh, opportunity and then in this communication creates some opportunities that we can exchange knowledge, ideas and thoughts and I call it poisoning the others or you know you can use more positive <laughs> words you know but but just you know infecting this this idea of you know talking to the nature, talking to understand you know understand their voice, give them a voice and all of this. And then what is my approach? I try to be always as radical as possible because when you're radical, people pay attention and try to see it. 
So just as an example, I just recently joined one of the competitions, a call for a monument design, and I proposed a, a B-size B replica for that competition. Okay. And just as an example of radicalism, just to say that, you know, while they are looking for huge, you know, kind of 50 meter height, you know, things, I just try to emphasize that, you know, they need to change their approach to right. size and scales and all of this. So, so, I mean, this, this was the conceptual part of it, just to say that, yes, I think, or, I mean, just another example. Now, just now I'm working for another design then it's a park design project. And what, I, what I'm doing, I'm putting all the humans in a cage in the park. So the park has a, inter- the, there is a cage in the park. Okay. So let's say cage because I'm calling it cage. It's a very beautiful cage, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the moment you enter to the park, you enter to the cage. Okay. But the rest of the park is for wildlife. Ah, but you, okay. from inside the cage, you can observe the wildlife, you can observe the environment, but you are always limited in that cage. Mm. So this is, this is again, just to, to emphasize that, okay, we are in this limit, you have to be in this limit. And then another issue in, that, in this recent design is that this cage is built of gabion walls, you know, so the two meshes, just for some people who don't know what is gabion wall, so two meshes and inside is filled by some other materials okay. and usually stones. But in my case, I use all the waste that remain in that park ex- recently, the land of that park, because it's a area that loads of construction waste is there, loads of other waste is there. So okay. I feel all of it in that gabion walls. So basically I cage humans in their wastes. So they observe nature through their wastes. Wow. So this is this is a kind of poetic approach that yeah. yes, I'm trying to achieve it. But what I'm doing there, I'm I'm just telling myself, okay, what I'm doing, I'm cleaning the waste that my previous generation or my generation created in that land. So it is not something that uh I'm not really allowed to do that ethically because this is a waste that just recently, you know, our generations created mm-hmm. or a previous just just in the last 50 years is created. So I am allowed to collect it. Okay. Put it somewhere. The gabion walls that I am building it is not really damaging the nature, the soil or anything. So it's all very temporal. You can just mm. wrap it them out and, you know, and then the rewilding process that I'm having in the rest of the park is just to leave it for mm. many years to become what it wants to be. So it is not just forcing something. So, yeah, my design approach is just to be as humble as possible. But, yeah, I can I can also give some practical uh, also ideas if we have time. So Of course, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have some, uh, let's say, concepts that we use in taking decisions. So one of them is, we say that we have four different approaches to nature. One is uh, just destroying it. So killing it or, you know, uh, the way that it wants to be, you just damage its, its, its travel or journey, you know, any, any material that it, 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 it is. So this is one way that usually we are doing this, this, we are choosing this way. And then the second one, which is also very dangerous, is domesticating it. Yeah. And uh, so domesticating nature, I mean, we, we speak about loads of examples, but imagine rivers. So can compare them with canals. Okay. So so canals are domesticated ways of rivers. I mean, as, as dogs and wolves. So naturally they don't exist even though they look alive even they even though i mean in in the canals you see loads of different kind of plants and you know animals and loads of things are living and also microbes <laughs> so but 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 doesn't mean that canals are rivers so yeah rivers are rivers and then 
uh, however, just just passing through it. So lo- lots of things that we are eating today are domesticated uh, yes. fruits, domesticated grains, domestic- yeah. domesticated. And still, it is matter of discussion that are these good for human or not? Because we know that we, we are, I mean, 57 percent of Hossein is microbes. Right. Yeah. So only forty three percent is human. So, and and we know wow. that evolution needs minimum one million year or hundreds of thousands of years. So ten thousand years is not enough that evolutionary mm. Hossein as a human or microbes inside Hossein adopt themselves to what I am eating as domesticated things. Yeah. So I mean these are all problematic things. So so destroying domestication and then Third one is taming. Taming is the part that we start uh, having a bit of positive, you know, feeling about it. So, and there are some good examples of taming. So one of them is, uh, for example, Native Americans, they were putting some some sort of, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, some sort of dams, but... I mean, just by using some bamboos yeah. or reeds that they let the water pass, but but some of the fishes could stock in it. Okay. Not all of the fishes. Yeah. But one in every hundred can stock in it and then they can eat it. So okay. by, by designing this structure, they were not changing the river. Mm. They were not killing all the fishes. They were not, you know, they were just, you know, Fishing some of them, some of them as as bears that are doing as well. Right. So it is, yes, it is a change in the nature, but it is not changing the yeah. genetics of the nature, but it changed its temporal behaviors. Yes, but just just for a while, it is there, and, and it's then, reversible. Yeah, exactly. In the first, you know, uh, rain, the the river will oh, wash sure all way. of these. Yeah. Uh, reeds and and there will be loads of fishes that can run out of it, you know. So the technology there is is a technology that, you know, I have a very very good friend designer that always says if if the fish has the chance to escape from your, uh, what's that, the rope, yeah, the rod, rod, then then it is ethical. Okay. <laughs> if the yeah. fish has the chance to select to bite it or not bite it then it is ethical. But if you are deciding, so just sending but a dynamite inside the river and yeah, killing yeah. all the fishes there, then it is not ethical. So if, I mean, if you give the chance to the nature to decide, that is that is what, what, what we start understanding it as ethical and we accept it. Yeah. And then the fourth stage is what we call it flourishing. Okay. Which usually... All the animals, plants, insects, microbes in nature, they use this one. So any action that they they do in nature, any change, is bringing a flourishing for the other beings or for others. You know, it is not only for them or it is minimum for them, but more for the nature. And the mm-hmm. best example, I give the example of beavers. Oh, yeah, so, I was just about to say. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought of immediately as well. <laughs> because, I mean, they, they close it. They, they create a dam, a very temporal one. They, they live there. But when they are there, the dam, because still water can pass, but it slows down, it slows down the water. So it acts as a filter. So it filters all the best topsoil that comes with river from the top mountains. So the best topsoil remains behind the dam. Uh-huh. And then uh, after a while, the holes in the dam grows. So it is not really enough or, I mean, it's not sustainable for them to con- constantly build it and fix it. So they decide okay. to leave it. And then they leave it. Uh, basically, after a while, the dam is collapsed and then the water guns, so the water level uh, reduces. And then because of the topsoil, a wonderful forest comes out of it. Ah, so if, yeah. if the beaver will not be there, the forest will not be there. So wow. this is this is the reason that they are there. So, And 
we always encourage this kind of approaches to nature so that that brings a much better life for the future mm-hmm. generations not for us so we we just accept that then okay now come to sorry it was a very long uh, no answer. that was very interesting yeah when, when you when you give me a piece of land and you tell me design it for rose the first thing I do, I will not design it for Ross. You know, so this is the most practical approach that I have. I will look who else is going to develop yeah. this land in the future. Hundred years later, two hundred years later, you know. So and then then start communicating with them and asking them what they need. What what can I okay, the still Ross is my client. In, <laughs> yes. uh, I, 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 yeah, uh, this hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but but after understanding the main clients who are the future people who are going to develop yeah. that land, uh, then I will come to Ross and I will try to answer Ross needs with the best answers that satisfy the future. Cl- and that main clients that are in the future. And just one last sentence, I see Ross as the guardian of that land. Mm. So this is, I mean, as it's it's one of the greatest critics that indigenous people gives to modern culture. They say that you are thinking that you are owners of the land, but we are thinking that the land owns us. So this is the main main difference. Uh, so okay. so Yes, I mean, if I'm living in this land, the land owns me. So the land employs me. The land let me to live here because the land, land, I'm responsible to feed the land, to work on the land, to make it a better uh, habitat for future generations of humans and non-humans. It's a kind of stewardship approach. Yes. Um, this, This, I mean, this approach really clashes a lot with, I think, how architects, and I'll pick on architects, especially here, uh, are, are traditionally taught, which is, you know, you will have a client and you will have your, uh, they will have their needs, the things they want to do on the site, and you'll have your artistic approach. And many architects l- will seek the opportunity to put their mark on a building or to leave their legacy on the skyline or something like that. What you're saying is it has to be a much more depersonalized approach is to say, like, it's not about you, it's not about your client, it's about the future generations that will come. And again, when we when we construct buildings now in cities, usually the mindset is that this building will last for 60 years and then it will likely get demolished and something else will go in. And that's sort of accepted as, like, the process of, of you know, that, that's just how things work in cities. But, of course, that's just, you know, such a waste of materials, it's so carbon intensive. How long more can we go on doing that? You're saying not 60 years, 200 years at a minimum, maybe. Yeah, minimum <laughs> or more. Yeah. It reminds me of, of, of you know, uh, Victorian and Georgian terraced houses that are still serving their original purpose uh, three, four, five generations later. And they're still the most, uh, you know, widely accepted as beautiful. Um, they're, you know, have, you know, judging by property prices, they're the most in demand you know, they're the kind of place that are still, yeah. you know, serving that multi-generational uh, approach. Ross, I, I, I had the chance to uh, to stay for a while in New York City. And it was quite, you know, let's say one of the best time in my life that I had the chance to study two, two different and contradictory cultures at the same time. One of them was, you know, New York is the capital city of capitalism and urbanization. <laughs> All of right. these, you know, these uh, concepts that I'm fighting with it. So this was one 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 side. But the other side, I is, I was studying in New York City the way that uh, Native Americans were settled in Manhattan. Ah, they yeah. settled in Manhattan. And this was, and also beavers, you know, the, the, the beaver is coming from that, that, you know, the other example of Indian Americans, you know, comes from that study. So this, this, I, I had the chance to study these two at the same time and, you know, observe it. So it, it is amazing. Just, just an example, you know, the people who were living in Manhattan, they were called Lenape. 
Linux. And, okay. and these Linux people, they they understood that the main, you know, okay. So I, I looked at how they were building their villages, and then I realized that village for them was a concept, was not material. Mm, okay. So house for them was a concept. And now I will explain it. What, what do I mean by concept? It was a set of collective knowledge. So for them, as it is for most of the nomads as well, like the people living in yurts, you know, or any other mm. kind of tents. So the material to build that house is everywhere. Yeah. What makes those materials a house is the skill to build it. The skill to know where to build it, how to build it, like the same is for the tents or uh, any any other uh, lightweight, you know, materials that, you know, indigenous people are building it. So you, you, you see, I mean, the materials are there everywhere. So you just just a matter of a few hours, a few days, you can build it. What is not there is the knowledge of building it, the knowledge that... So Native Americans, they understood this value, so they invested on this knowledge. The way to build it and uh, what kind of material they use, how they use, how they bring them together, where they build, and all of this. So... What they own at the end and makes it their house and shelter them is that knowledge. Is that mm. is not that material. Mm. So the way that they were living was every 15 to 20 years, they were rebuilding their villages. Yeah. And then I... I spend loads of time to understand why every 15 to 20 years. Okay. So there is a pattern of time as again, another emphasize on it, that this is something that is always ignored in modern culture, but this pattern of uh, time is, is very essential and we need to mm. uh, be mindful about that. And they choose every 15 to 20 years to rebuild their village in somewhere else. And then I realized that I, there, are, there are loads of reasons for that. One of them is 15 to 20 years means one generation. So every new generation participates in the building oh, of see. the village. So they learn, experience, and transfer to the next generation. Yeah, that makes perfect Such sense. Such an amazing, you know, uh, cycle of, yeah. Building and demolition. And then the second is Indian Americans, they were agriculture, uh, partially agriculture societies. So they okay. were growing foods. Okay. And agriculture destroys. So destroys the soil, destroys the ecosystem, destroys everything. So if you settle somewhere and continue growing food in that land, growing, you know, bean and, you know, <laughs> cabbage and uh, corn. Mm -hmm. So you will demolish the soil, you will demolish the system, ecosystem, wildlife, everything in that area. But if you just do it temporarily uh. and then leave it, that area will, will regenerate. flourish again. Yeah. yeah. So this, this has also another ecological reason for that. That's and very interesting. This is, this is probably the clue that we, we, we really, you know, uh, so in one of the books, I mean, there are loads of poems remaining from their cultures, not, not really, you know, kind of books that we know, but we try to learn from their poems. And in one of them, it is written that, you know, these Lenape people, they don't have any, they don't own anything. They don't have yeah. any belonging, not only houses or villages or lands or, you know, but, but, even even some tools, you know? Yeah. Because they know how to build the tools, so they yeah. don't need tools. 
if you need it you just have the materials nearby and you just make it and make it oh, so fascinating but do you think i mean is it is it even possible for us to bring those principles back in uh when our our reality is so different to that now uh i think it is because i believe that uh you know I think it is, and it must be, because there is no other way. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. It is just a matter of fight, and you know, uh, dream, and you know, design, probably. So, so yeah, I, 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 I'm very hopeful about the technologies that we have today. So they are very dangerous. But as at the same time, they are very hopeful. So, okay. I mean, Ross and Hossein, they belong to two different countries, two different, you know, they have never met each other. They have never heard from each other. Maybe they have none, not any common friend, but they can meet and talk today. And this is, this yeah. is great. Absolutely. So this is, this is great that, you know, in my architecture courses or modules, you know, I have the chance to invite an anthropologist. I have the chance to invite a biologist. So, I mean, just a few years ago, it was very odd to mm. invite a non-architect to architecture module. So let's yeah. say that I, I see all these positive changes that we started uh, learning from each other, talking to each other, trying to read. I mean, all of us, imagine how much we are started we started learning from medicine from biology from from loads of other other sciences as well so i think that that's one dimensional man that you know industrial uh modern culture was trying to create it at least in some cases it started to break down mm. and then there is another very good hope that we have loads of people that they they, they want to do something for this planet and they want to do something for the uh, for their generation or next generation, and they do. And the only problem is that I believe that we really don't know how to do that because right. we try to use the mindset that right. is educated in the schools and universities of this modern industrial urbanized culture to fix this modern, urbanized, you know, industrial mm. culture. And it is impossible. Uh, we need another school. We need, we need to listen to something else. And Bill Mollison, the founder of permaculture design, always says, before you design, go to the land and try to listen to the land, observe the land, see the birds. The best teacher is forest. The best teacher is ocean. Uh, I mean, I, uh, you, I, I'm not sure uh, if if you've seen the movie of my octopus teacher. No, I haven't yet. I've heard about it though. Video. It is a very good good movie. It's just about one octopus and one man, you know. And <laughs> so one man decides to. I mean, one modern, just recent man yeah. decides to dive every day for many years to the same spot <sighs> and everybody criticizes him why you just dive the same spot and okay. he dives the same spot and he just observed the same octopus wow for many years every day the same spot the same octopus and he learns loads of things from that octopus <laughs> That one octopus, that one space, one small piece of uh, ocean. So just just want to say that, yeah, I mean, I think we, we, we started uh, communicating and we started knowing all of this. This movie is out and even it is in, in one of the commercial TV channels. So, I mean, all of these are good news. So I want to look at this, uh, yeah, positive parts. And I say that, yes. But the only thing is missing is just to change this mindset, to understand that this mindset will not help us. We cannot, I, 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 as my hobby, I attend some of these ecological, <laughs> uh, let's say, 
meetings. Okay. So uh, one of the recent ones that I attend was about reforesting Britain. So that's the reason uh, that yeah. I'm using this a lot. So there is a budget for reducing the carbon footprint of Britain. There is a huge budget there and loads of companies and, you know, corporate uh, organizations to understand how they can use this budget and they can buy a land and reforest it and use this, you know, funding for that. And I attend one of their meetings and, you know, it is, yeah, it's just a pity that, you know, these are happening and these are happening with the, with the goodwill or good mm. intention or positive intention. And then all of these, you know, is, is the main reason that people don't listen to Hussein anymore because Hussein's <laughs> sound is, is uh, what's that? Is somehow silenced by all of these green, you know, uh, sounds that are very strong and everywhere. It is mm. like you know, all if you if you talk any to any communist leftist person, they always say that it is all because of Soviet Union or Cuba that you know nobody listens to us, and they are right because you know when you say leftism or socialism or you know the first reference yeah. goes there because their their sound was very strong, and. Yeah, that is that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> I I often use the the example of the the uh, central government in Ireland uh, tra- planting trees because uh, as part of you know t- taking action on climate change and trying to um, sequester carbon, the Irish government has been planting these monoculture plantations of Sitka spruce trees um, across across Ireland. And uh, I mean, Sitka spruce trees are a North American tree; they're not native to Ireland. They're planted one type of tree on a whole field and, uh, you know, causes problems with acidification of the soil. It doesn't serve the local biodiversity, causes problems with local rivers because the acid is is, is you know, seeping into the water. And also local people hate them because they're not culturally appropriate for the location. People don't, don't like them. They feel uh, very isolated by having them there. And it's just this this thing of, you know, you, you came at it with this, one this mindset of achieving one thing and you caused all these extra problems by doing that and that's where the sort of humility to 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 say maybe we don't have maybe we can't fix these problems with simple solutions exactly yeah what what do you suggest for people who are you know sort of involved in the climate change uh action on climate change want to get involved in sustainability and they feel very motivated to take action because of course we know that you know things are happening so quickly we need to take drastic action to put us onto a right course. What you're saying is that it's very difficult to know if the action you're taking is, is appropriate or, or, or is work. So how, how do you deal with that sort of tension? Yeah, if we, I mean, I imagine if, I, if I'm going to uh, develop a campaign or fight for, for this aim, what can I do immediately without any, without any study, without any need for any study or anything? We, we know that the first thing that there is no problem in it is just leave nature as it is. Right. So this is this is this is the less riskiest decision that we can have. Okay. So, okay. Instead of planting forests, I mean, no, as you said, I mean, this is a big problem to have monoculture, but also this is a big problem to have polyculture as well. I mean, because. Uh, we think that we know which trees with which trees and you know where and but we know that we don't know as well so Mm. for that reason that's also risky so i would say imagine all the parks in the uk if you just don't cut their grasses if you don't plant the grasses anymore just let it be i mean loads of these lands were meadows and let, let mm. the meadows grow, let them flourish insects, let the f- insects flourish the wildlife and, and all of it. And, and be patient, let it be, you know. So this is one of the biggest problems that we have. We are not patient at all. So uh, I have, I have some, some of my, let's say, uh, students that they feel very, uh, let's say, intimate. So 
after sessions, they ask me privately, are you reformist or revolutionary? I always say, of course I am revolutionary. You know, it is, it is impossible. If you're, I mean, reform what? There is no, there is no way to reform it. So of course I'm revolutionary, but the revolution that I'm imagining it will come 1000 years later, <sighs> or it takes 1000 years that revolution comes minimum because this revolution that I am suffering from it, which is called agricultural revolution, or it is called industrial revolution, mm -hmm. came in thousands of years. It's not happened in one night, you know? Mm. So, so for that reason, the, the solution also comes in 1,000 years. Wow. Just, just, just we need to be patient and take the correct steps. So to heal it, to heal this, I mean, it is, it is I mean, another example, uh, I, I use the concept of healing a lot. So uh, the system is, you know, we have loads of pathologies in the system. You know, it's sick. It's the system. The planet is not sick. We are yeah. sick, but the planet is not sick. Even with loads of garbage and loads of other things, it's, it's not sick. But we are sick. Just human is sick. Human mind is sick. So Bookchin always says that we don't have uh, ecological crisis. We don't have... Uh, this 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 kind of crisis we have ethical crisis and that's that's in mind of you know human beings this is this is the biggest crisis that we have so uh, what one one of the main things that uh, we can do is uh, just just to accept this uh, limits just to let it be and then try to have positive uh, steps a bit towards it. And just ensure that any positive steps, because billions of people in many generations, they are going to take them, they are going to be really, really impactful and they will have a big change uh, in, a, in a long term. So, yes, I mean, there are some, some uh, actions that we can take even without, without anything, without any design needed and yeah just 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 let it be let it let let everything that is possible to to be as as it is possible and reduce the the negative impacts doesn't need any decision to be taken so we, we all know that uh what we buy and consume there are 99 percent you know <laughs> have negative impacts so we need to True. stop buying them. We need to encourage people who are uh, growing uh, food in a better way. We need, we need to stop buying anything, you know. Uh, we need to stop buying gifts for anyone. Uh, I mean, th these are some very simple things, but, but uh, I think they are, they are quite impactful because not impactful on nature. I mean but impactful in, in, in the meaning of creating awareness. So if, mm -hmm. I, if you invite me to your birthday and I come and you have 50 people there and I will tell you that, Ross, I didn't buy you anything because <laughs> I don't want to feed the system, basically. <sighs> but if you want, you know, what uh, my, my partner and I, and we have two children, uh, one of the greatest uh let's say moments that we 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 think we have is in in our birthdays uh we believe that you know we we need to give something yeah so it is not to take something but to 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 be grateful to right. this planet that give us the chance to live on it we need to give something so that day is a day that we need to donate it mm to the others. So these others can be homeless people, these others can be insects, these others can be trees, I don't know. But but this is a day that we need to learn to give it, to donate it. Not only that day, but this is a practice, just, just as a kind of activism. So, so instead of telling to each other happy birthday, just joining each other in something good, doing something good for our planet, not because of if I do something good for 
my garden, the planet is going to be saved, but this is just to uh, increase awareness in people. So I just em- emphasize on it because what we need today is this awareness. This is this is the first priority we need. So anything we do, if the result is creating awareness, is good. It, it, it's sort of what you're saying about, you know, the, the, the mindset shift, once you get the mindset shift, that all the actions follow from there. And that sort of facilitates you to start acting differently. Uh, that's sort of the key to it, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with Donella Meadows, uh, the systems thinker from MIT. Yeah. She has a great book called uh, Thinking in Systems. Yeah. And in the book, she talks about all the way leverage points within systems yeah, where yeah, you can yeah. enact change. And the number one leverage point is the paradigm shift. Because yeah. once you shift the paradigm, all the other actions within the system will shift. So I, I, I totally understand your your approach, and you know, you've given me a lot to digest, a lot to think about. Um, but I want to be respectful of your time, and I rather than talking to you all day, which I certainly could do. Um, is there anything else you want to bring up while I have you here, or should we should we just wrap up? I think it was a great opportunity. Thank you. It was it was really uh, joyful. I think this this word joy, I really enjoy it uh, because this is another thing that I definitely recommend. I was always in my life a human activist, a human rights activist. Okay. uh, And I was always an activist. So don't take it serious. Just enjoy. (laughs) Enjoying is one of the main enemies of this system as well. So... uh, seriousness is exactly what the curse of this system so nothing serious nothing productive productive is problem seriousness is problem you know so but but the opposite concepts like you know laughter you know like like enjoy like uh like like joy yeah like like laziness like not creativity not not, not producing you know these these are definitely very positive impacts. So not doing anything is is something very very good. So uh, and yeah, we need we need to just do it. And uh, so it was a yeah, as I said, it was a great j- joy for me talking to you. And I wish also we could talk for all uh, all day and night, but <laughs> I think nobody will listen. <laughs> So it's <laughs> yeah, it would just be for our own benefit. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Hossein. I really, really appreciate. It. Um, where can people find out more about you and your uh, educational platform and that kind of thing? Uh, we, we, as I said at the beginning, uh, we we are running a, a, at the moment a kind of training platform with the name of Ecodemia. So, uh, and uh, if you just Google it, academia.org.uk. So we are trying to develop some sort of uh, re-indigenized knowledge. We are, we are mm. at the beginning of the way. Uh, we, as, as I said, you know, we are, we are very humble. We know that we, we don't know a lot. We know that what is not good, but we don't know what it is good, but we are trying to discover it together. Uh, so we created a platform that we share and we, we come together, discuss. And so the courses that we designed are type of courses that uh, it's, it's based on discussion and, you know, collective, uh, let's say, yeah, talk and mm. experience. And uh, we, yeah, and in, in the evolution as well. So this is a platform that uh, they can find more about uh, these these works. And yeah, that's it. Interesting. Great. Well, I'll put a link to that in the podcast description so people can go and find that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Mm-hmm.